morning y'all so what we've got here ah snap crackles pops um we've got miss peregrine's home for peculiar children what we're on today is book ah, book one chapter four i almost got those two swapped how silly anyway <clears throat> whilst you're grabbing your copy of this book do go ahead and like, subscribe, maybe leave a comment down below on if you want the next few books ordered or read. Um, uh, <clears throat> also, I did want to give you guys um, some kudos and say thank you very much for supporting my channel the way that you guys can. It's been uh, very, very helpful the anonymous and non-anonymous donations as well as all the shares that I see going on on my channel as well as all the all the stuff that's been going on that you guys have given me to be able to build and grow this channel so let's go ahead here and jump right into chapter four <clears throat> once I'd hopped and tripped and felt my way like a blind man through the woods and fog, and remerged into the world of sun and light. I was surprised the f sun sinking and the light going red. Somehow, the whole day had slipped away, and the pub my dad was waiting for me. A black as night beer and his open laptop on the table in front of him. I sat down and swiped his beer before he'd had a chance to even look up from typing. Oh, my sweet lord, I sputtered, choking down a mouthful. What is this? Fermented motor oil? Just about, he said laughing, and then snatched it back. It's not like American beer. Not that you'd know what that tastes like, right? Absolutely not, I said with a wink even though it was true. My dad liked to believe I was so popular and adventuresome as he was at my age. A myth it had always seemed easiest to perpetuate. I underwent a brief, in brief interrogation about how I'd gotten to the house and who had taken me there, and because the easiest kind of lying is when you leave things out of a story rather than make them up. I passed with flying colors. I conveniently forgot to mention that Worm and Dylan had tricked me into wading through sheep excrement and then bailed out half a mile from our destination. Sorry about that, guys. Dad seemed pleased that I'd already managed to meet a couple of kids my own age. I guess I always also forgot to mention the part about them hating me. So how was the house? Trashed, he winced. Guess it's been a long time since your grandpa lived there, huh? Yeah, or anyone. He closed the laptop, a sure sign I was about to receive his full attention. I can see you're disappointed. Well, I didn't come thousands of miles looking for a house full of creepy garbage. So what are you going to do? Find people to talk to. Someone will know what happened to the kids who used to live there. I figure a few of them must still be alive, on the mainland if not around here, in a nursing home or something. Sure, that's an idea. He didn't sound convinced, though. There was an odd pause, and then he said, So, do you feel like you're starting to get a better handle on who your grandpa was being here? I thought about it. I don't know. I guess so. It's just an island, you know. He nodded. Exactly. What about you? Me? He shrugged. I gave up trying to understand my father a long, long time ago. That's sad. Weren't you interested? Sure I was. Then, after a while, I wasn't anymore. I could feel the conversation going in a direction I wasn't entirely comfortable with, but I persisted anyway. Why not? 
When someone won't let you in, eventually you stop knocking. Know what I mean? He hardly ever talked like this. Maybe it was the beer, or that we were so far from home. Or maybe he decided I was finally old enough to hear this stuff. Whatever the reason, I didn't want him to stop. But he was your dad. How could you just give up? It wasn't me who gave up, he said a little too loudly, and then looked down, embarrassed, and swirled the beer in his glass. It's just that the truth is, I think your grandpa didn't know how to be a dad, but he felt like he had to be one anyway, because none of his brothers or sisters survived the war. So he dealt with it by being gone all the time, on hunting trips, business trips, you name it. And even when he was around, it was like he wasn't. Is this about that one Halloween? What are you talking about? You know, from the picture. It was an old story, and it went like this. It was Halloween. My dad was four or five years old and had never been trick-or-treating, and Grandpa Portman had promised to take him when he got off work. My grandmother had bought my dad this ridiculously pink bunny costume, but he put it on and sat by the driveway waiting for Grandpa Portman to come home from about five o'clock until nightfall. But he never did. Grandpa was, Grandma was so mad that she took a picture of my dad crying on the street just so she could show my grandfather what a huge asshole he was. Needless to say, that picture has long been an object of legend among members of my family and a great embarrassment for my father. It was a lot more than just one Halloween, he grumbled. Really, Jake, you were close to him than I ever was. I don't know. There was just something unspoken between the two of you. I didn't know how to respond. Was he jealous of me? Why are you telling me this? Because you're my son. And I don't want you to get hurt. Hurt? How? He paused. Outside the clouds shifted, and the last rays of daylight throwing our shadows against the wall. I got a sick feeling in my stomach, like when your parents are about to tell you they're splitting up, but you know it before they even open their mouths. I never dug too deep with your grandpa. Because I was afraid what I'd find, he said finally. You mean about the war? No. Your grandpa kept those secrets because they were painful. I understood that. I mean about the traveling, him being gone all the time. What he really was doing. I think, I think your aunt and I both thought that there was another woman. Maybe more than one. I let it hang between us for a moment. My face tingled strangely. That's crazy, Dad. We found a letter once. It was from a woman whose name we didn't know, addressed to your grandfather. I love you. I miss you. When are you coming back? That kind of thing. Seedy lipstick on the collar type stuff. I'll never forget it. I felt a hot stab of shame, like somehow it was my own crime he was describing, and yet I couldn't quite believe it. We tore up the letter and flushed it down the toilet. Never found another one either. Guess he was more careful after that? I didn't know what to say, and I couldn't look at my father. I'm sorry, Jake. This must be hard to hear. I know how much you worshipped him. He reached out and squeezed my shoulder, but I shrugged him off. Then, scraped back my chair and stood up. I don't worship anyone. 
Okay. I just... I didn't want you to be surprised, that's all. I grabbed my jacket and slung it over my shoulder. What are you doing? Dinner's on its way. You're wrong about him, I said, and I'm going to prove it. He sighed. It was a letting go kind of sigh. Okay, I hope you do. I slammed out of the priest hole and started walking, heading nowhere in particular. Sometimes you just need to go through a door. It was true, of course. What my dad had said. I did worship my grandfather. There were things about him that I needed to be true. And his being an adulterer was not one of them. When I was a kid, Grandpa Portman's fantastic stories meant it was possible to live a magical life. Even after I stopped believing them, there was still something magical about my grandfather. To have endured all the horrors he did. To have seen the worst of humanity and have your life made unrecognizable by it. To come out of all that the honorable and good and brave person I knew him to be. That was magical. So I couldn't believe he was a liar and a cheater and a bad father. Because if Grandpa Portman wasn't honorable and good, I wasn't sure anyone could be. The museum's doors were opened and its lights were on, but no one seemed to be inside. I'd gone there to find the curator, hoping he knew a thing or two about the island's history and people, and could shed some light on the empty house and the whereabouts of its former inhabitants. Figuring he'd just stepped out for a minute, the crowds weren't exactly kicking down his door, I wandered into the sanctuary to kill time, checking out museum displays. The exhibits, such as they were, were arranged in big, open-fronted cabinets that lined the walls and stood where pews had once been. For the most part, they were unspeakably boring, all about life in a traditional fishing village and the enduring mysteries of animal husbandry. But one exhibit stood out from the rest. It was in a place of honor at the front of the room, in a fancy case that rested atop what had been the altar. It lived behind a rope I stepped over, and a little warning sign I didn't bother to read. And its case had polished wooden sides and a plexiglass top so that you could only see into it from above. When I looked inside, I think I actually gasped, and for one panicky second thought, monster. Because I had suddenly and unexpectedly come face to face with a blackened corpse. Its shrunken body bore an uncanny resemblance to the creatures that had haunted my dreams, as did the color of its flesh, which was like something that had been spit-roasted over a flame. But when the body failed to come alive and scar my mind forever by breaking the glass and going for my jugular, my initial panic subsided. It was just a museum display, albeit an excessively morbid one. I see you've met the old man, called a voice from behind me, and I turned to see the curator striding in my direction. He handled it pretty well. I've seen grown men faint dead away. He grinned and reached out to shake my hand. Martin Paget, don't believe I caught your name the other day. Jacob Portman, I said. Who's this? Wales' most famous murder victim? Ha ha ha! Well, he might be that too, though I never thought of him that way. He's our island's senior most resident, better known in archaeological circles has Carnholm Man. Though, to us, he's just an old man, more than 2,700 years old to be exact, though he was only 16 when he died, so he's rather a young man, really. 2,700? I said, glancing at the dead boy's face, his delicate features somehow perfectly preserved. But he looks so... 
That's what happens when you spend your golden years in a place where oxygen and bacteria can't exist, like the underside of our bog. It's a regular fountain of youth down there, provided you're already dead, that is. That's where you found him? The bog? He laughed. Not me. Turf cutters did, digging for peat by the big stone carn out there, back in the 70s. He looked so fresh, they thought there might be a killer on the loose in Carnholm. Till the cops had it look at the Stone Age bow in his hand and the noose of human hair around his neck. They don't make them like that anymore. I shuddered. Sounds like a human sacrifice or something. Exactly. He was done in by a combination of strangulation, drowning, and disembowelment, and a blow to the head. Seems rather like overkill, don't you think? I guess so. Martin roared with laughter. He guesses so? Yeah, 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 okay, it does. Sure it does. But the really fascinating thing, to us modern folk anyway, is that in all likelihood, the boy went to his death willingly, eagerly even. His people believed that bogs, and our bog in particular, were entrances to the world of the gods, and so the perfect place to offer up their most precious gifts, themselves. That's insane! I suppose. Though I imagine we're killing ourselves right now all in ways that'll seem insane to people in the future. And as doors to the next world go, a bog ain't a bad choice. It's not quite water, and it's not quite land. It's an in-between place. He bent over the case, studying the figure inside. Isn't he beautiful? I looked at the body again, throttled and flayed and drowned and somehow made immortal in the process. I don't think so, I said. Martin straightened and then began to speak in a grandiose tone. Come, you, and gaze upon the tar man. Blackly he reposes, tender face the keller of soot, weathered limbs like vines of coal, feet lumps of driftwood hung with shriveled grapes. He threw his arms out like a cammy stage actor and began to strut around the case. Come, you, and bear witness to the cruel art of his wounds. Prelude and me... Uh, meandering lines drawn by knives, brain and bone exposed by stones, the rope still digging at his throat. First fruit slashed and dumped, seeker of heaven, old man arrested in youth, I almost love you. He took a theatrical bow as I applauded. Wow, I said, did you write that? Guilty he replied in a sheepish smile. I twiddle about with lines of verse now and then, but it's only a hobby. In any case, thank you for indulging me. I wondered what this odd, well-spoken man was doing on Carnholm, with his pleated slacks and half-baked poems, looking more like a bank manager than someone who lived on a wind-swept island with one phone and no paved roads. Now, I'd be happy to show you the rest of my collection, he said, escorting me toward the door, but I'm afraid it's shutting up time. If you'd like to come back tomorrow, however... Actually, I was hoping you might know something, I said, stopping him before he could shoo me out. It's about the house I mentioned this morning. I went to see it. Well, he exclaimed, I thought I'd scared you off of it. How's our haunted mansion faring these days? Still standing? I assured him that it was, then got right to the point. The people that lived there. Do you have any idea what happened to them? They're dead, he replied. Happened a long time ago. I was surprised, though I probably shouldn't have been. Miss Peregrine was old. 
old people die. But that didn't mean my search was over. I'm looking for anyone else who might have lived there, too. Not just the headmistress. All dead, he repeated slowly. No one's lived there since the war. That took me a moment to process. What do you mean? What war? When we say the war around here, my boy, there's only one that we mean. The second. It was a German air raid that got him, if I'm not mistaken. No, that can't be right. He nodded. In those days, there was an anti-aircraft gun battery at the far tip of the island, past the wood where the house is. It made Karnholm a legitimate military target. Now that legitimate mattered much to the Germans one way or another, mind you. Anyway, one of the bombs went off track, and while well, he shook his head, nasty luck. No! That can't be right, I said again, though I was starting to wonder. Why don't you sit down and let me fix you some tea, he said. You look a bit off mark. Just, just feeling a little light-headed. He led me to a chair in his office, and I went to make the tea. I tried to collect my thoughts. Bombed in the war? That would certainly explain those rooms with blown-out walls. But what about the letter from Miss Peregrine? Postmarked, Carnholm, sent just 15 years ago. Martin returned, handing me a mug. There's a nip of pendulin in it, he said. Secret recipe, you know. Should get you sorted in no time. I thanked him and took a sip, realizing too late that the secret ingredient was high-test whiskey. It felt like napalm flushing down my esophagus. It does have a certain kick, I admitted, my face going red. He frowned. Reckon I ought to fetch your father. No, no. I'll be fine. But if there's anything else you can tell me about the attack, I'd be grateful. Martin settled into a chair opposite me. About that. I'm curious. You say your grandfather met, lived there? He never mentioned it? I'm curious about that, too, he said. I guess I must have been after his time. Did it happen late in the war or early? I'm ashamed to admit I don't know. But if you're keen, I can introduce you to someone who does. My uncle, Augie. He's 83, lived here his whole life, still sharp as a tack. Martin glanced at his watch. If we catch him before Father Ted comes to the telly, I'm sure he'd be more than happy to tell you anything you like. Ten minutes later, Martin and I wedged deep in overstuffed sofa in Augie's living room, which was piled high with books and boxes of worn-out shoes and enough lamps to light a Carlsbad cavern, all but one of them unplugged. Living in a remote island, I was starting to realize, turned people into pack rats. Augie sat facing us in a threadbare blazer and pajama bottoms, as if he'd been expecting company, but not pants worthy of company, and rocked endlessly in a plastic-covered easy chair as he talked. He seemed happy just to have an audience. And after he'd gone on at length about the weather and Welsh politics and the story stated of today's youth, Martin was finally able to steer him around to the attack and the children from the home. Sure, I remember them, he said. Odd collection of people. We'd see them in town now and again, the children. Sometimes there's their minder woman, too. Buying milk and medicine and what have you, you'd say good morning and they'd look the other way. Kept to themselves, they did, off in that big house. 
A lot of talk about what might have been going on there, though no one knew for sure. What kind of talk? A lot of rot. Like I said, no one knew. All I can say is they weren't your regular sort of orphan children. Not like them, um, not a home kids they got in other places. Who you'll see come into town for parades and things and always have time for chat. This lot was different. Some of them couldn't even speak the king's English, or any English for that matter. Because they weren't really orphans, I said. They were refugees from other countries, Poland, Austria, Czechoslovakia. Is that what they were now? Augie said, cocking an eyebrow at me. Funny, I hadn't heard that. He seemed offended, like I'd insulted him by pretending to know more about his island than he did. His chair, rocking, got faster, more aggressive. If this was the kind of reception my grandpa and the other kids got on Carnholm, I thought, no wonder they kept to themselves. Martin cleared his throat. So, uncle, the bombing. Oh, keep your hair on. Yes, yes, the goddamn Jerry's. Who could forget them? He launched into a long-winded description of what life on the island was like under the threat of German air raids. The blaring sirens, the panicked scrambles for shelter, the volunteer air raid warden who ran from house to house at night making sure shades had been drawn and streetlights were put out to rob the enemy pilots of easy targets. They prepared as best they could, but never really thought they'd get hit, given all the ports and factories on the mainland, all much more important targets than Carnholm's little gun emplacement. But one night, the bombs began to fell. The noise was dreadful, Augie said. It was like giants stamping across the island, and it seemed to go on for ages. They gave us all a hell of a pounding, though no one in town was killed, thank heaven. Can't say the same for the gunner boys, though they gave as good as they got. Nor the poor souls at the orphan home. One bomb was all it took. Gave up their lives for Britain, they did. So wherever they was from, God bless them for that. Do you remember when it happened, I asked? Early in the war or late? I can't tell you the exact day, he said. It was the 3rd of September, 1940. The air seemed to go out of the room. I flushed to my grandfather's ashen face, his lips just barely moving, uttering those very words. September 3rd, 1940. Are, are, are you, you, you sure about that? That, that was, th that day? I never got to fight, he said. Too young by a year. That one night was my whole war. So yes, I'm sure. I felt numb, disconnected. It was too strange. Was someone playing a joke on me, I wondered? A weird unfunny joke? And there weren't any survivors at all? Martin asked. The old man thought for a moment, his gaze drifting up to the ceiling. Now that you mention it, he said, I reckon there were, j just one, a young man, not much older than this boy here. His rocking stopped as he remembered it. Walked into town the morning after, not with a scratch upon him. Hardly seemed perturbed at all, considering he'd just seen all his mates go to their reward. It was the queerest thing. He was probably in shock, Martin said. I shouldn't wonder, replied Augie. He spoke only once, to ask my father when the next boat was leaving for the mainland. Said he wanted to take up arms directly and kill the damned monsters who murdered his people. Augie's story was nearly as far-fetched as the ones Grandpa Portman used to tell, and yet I had no reason to doubt him. 
I knew him, I said. He was my grandfather. He looked at me, astonished. Well, Augie said, I'll be blessed. I excused myself and stood up. Martin, remarking that I seemed out of sorts, offered to walk me back to the pub, but I declined. I needed to be alone with my thoughts. Come and see me soon, then. He said, and I promised that I would. I took the long way back, past the swaying lights of the harbor, the air heavy with brine, and with chimney smoke from a hundred hearth fires. I walked to the end of a dock and watched the moon rise over the water, imagining my grandfather standing there on what awful morning after, numb with shock, waiting for a boat that would take him away from all the death he'd endure to war and more death. There was no escaping the monsters, not even on this island, no bigger on a map than a grain of sand, protected by mountains of fog, and sharp rocks and seething tides, not anywhere. That was the awful truth my grandfather had tried to protect me from. In the distance, I heard the generators sputter and spin down, and all the lights along the harbor and in house windows behind me surged for a moment before going dark. I imagined how such a thing might look from an airplane's height, the whole island suddenly winking out as if it had never been there at all. A supernova in miniature. I walked back by moonlight, feeling small. I found my dad in the pub at the same table where he'd been, a half-eaten plate of beef and gravy congealing into grease before him. Look who's back, he said as I sat down. I saved your dinner for you. I'm not hungry, I said, and I told him what I'd learned about Grandpa Portman. He seemed more angry then surprised. I can't believe he never brought this up, he said. Not one time. I could understand his anger. It was one thing for grandparents to withhold something like that from a grandchild. Quite enough for a father to keep it from his son, and for so long. I tried to steer the conversation in a more positive direction. It's amazing, isn't it? Everything he went through... My father nodded. I don't think we'll ever know the full extent of it. Grandpa Portman really knew how to keep a secret, didn't he? Are you kidding? That man was an emotional Fort Knox. I wonder if it doesn't explain something, though. Why he acted so distant when you were little. Dad gave me a sharp look and I knew I needed to make my point quickly or risk overstepping. He'd already lost his family twice before, once in Poland, and then again here, his adopted family. So when you and Aunt Susie came along, once bombed, twice shy? I'm serious. Don't you think this could mean that maybe he wasn't cheating on Grandma after all? I don't know, Jake. I guess... I don't believe things are ever that simple. He let out a sigh, breath fogging the inside of his beer glass. I think I know what all this really explains, though. Why you and Grandpa were so close. Uh, okay. It took him 50 years to get over his fear of having a family. You came along at just the right time. I didn't know how to respond. How do I say, I'm sorry your father didn't love you enough to your own dad? I couldn't. So instead, I just said goodnight and headed upstairs to bed. I tossed and turned most of the night. I couldn't stop thinking about the letters, the one my dad and Aunt Susie had found as kids, from this other woman, and the one I'd found a month ago, from Miss Peregrine, the thought that kept me awake was this. What if they were the same woman? The postmark on Miss Peregrine's letters was 15 years old, but by all accounts she'd been blown up in the stratosphere back in 1940. So my mind, that left two possible explanations. 
Either my grandfather had been corresponding with a dead person, admittedly unlikely, or the person who wrote the letter was not, in fact, Miss Peregrine, but someone who was using her identity to disguise her own. Why would you disguise your identity in a letter? Because you have something to hide. Because you are the other woman. What if the only thing I had discovered on this trip was that my grandfather was an adulterous liar? In his last breaths, he was trying to tell me about the death of his adopted family, or admit to some tottery, decades-long affair. Maybe it was both. And the truth was that by the time he was a young man, he'd had his family torn apart so many times he no longer knew how to have one or to be faithful to one. It was all just guesswork, though. I didn't know. And there was no one to ask. Anyone who might have had the answer was long dead. In less than 24 hours, the whole trip had become pointless. I fell into an uneasy sleep. At dawn, I awoke to the sound of something in my room. Rolling over to see what it was, I bolted upright in bed. A large bird was perched on my dresser, staring me down. It had a sleek head, feathered in gray, and talons that clacked on the wooden dresser as it sidled back and forth along the edge, as if to get a better look at me. I stared back rigidly wondering if this could be a dream. I called out for my dad, and the sound of my voice, the bird launched itself off of its dresser. I threw my arm across my face and rolled away, and when I peeked again, it was gone, flown out the open window. My dad stumbled in, all bleary-eyed. What's going on? I showed him the talon marks on the dresser, and a feather that had landed on the floor. God, that's weird he said, turning it over in his hand. Peregrines almost never come close to humans. I thought maybe I'd heard him wrong. Did you say peregrines? He held up the feather. A peregrine falcon, he said. They're amazing creatures, the fastest birds on earth. They're like shapeshifters, the way they streamlined their bodies in the air. The name was just a weird coincidence but it left me in an uncanny feeling I couldn't shake. Over breakfast, I began to wonder if I'd given up too easily, though it was true that no one was left alive whom I could talk to about Grandfather. There was still the house, a lot of it unexplored. If I'd ever had and held answers about my Grandfather, in the form of letters, maybe, or a photo album, or a diary, They'd probably burned up or rotted away decades ago. But I, if I left the island without making sure, I knew I'd regret it. And that is somewhat how someone who is unusually susceptible to nightmares, night terrors, the creeps, the willies, and seeing things that aren't really there, talks himself into making one last trip to the abandoned, almost certainly haunted house where a dozen or more children met their untimely end. Thank you for listening to Chapter 4 with me of Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children. If this is something that intrigues you, or something that you'd like me to read more of the series of, do let me know down in the comments below. And this is something that will kind of continue. Again, also... If you guys find some of the other book series that I've read and decide that that's something that you would like me to continue on, do go ahead and leave the comments down below on those as well as I look at them to decide whether to purchase the next book in the series or whether to just move on to the next series. Again, I do want to thank you guys very much for all that you guys have done for my channel and for all the help that you've done for me personally so that I can keep reading for you guys. You all have a wonderful and blessed day.